Well, hello and good morning to you. Thank you for joining us for our Sunday morning live stream. My name is John, in case you don't know me. And hey, if I haven't greeted you already, belated, belated Merry Christmas to you. And no matter what uh, your situation is, if you went to go see family, if you kept things a little more low key this year, which is understandable, uh, I know I'm glad that it's the joy of Jesus uh, that informs my celebration and informs our worship this morning. So I pray that that's true for you, that the joy of the Lord is your strength as it is mine. And just a heads up, guys, uh, we actually have a special word today from our very own Solomon Smart. So wherever, wherever you are out there, give him some love, give him some snaps, some claps. And uh, Solo, we love you, buddy. Thanks, for, uh, thanks in advance for, for sharing the word with us. Looking forward to it. Uh, before we jump in, let's pray. Let's lift up this morning. Let's give Jesus the honor and the, the thanks that he deserves. Yeah. Jesus, we love you. We thank you uh, just simply for the gift it is that you are. Uh, we thank you for giving yourself so freely to us, for making yourself uh, so knowable. And you came down and you were, you were touchable and seekable and understandable. And Jesus, we thank you for that. We thank you that uh, your heart is to reveal more and more of yourself to us and that for us, uh, we should look more and more like you. Thank you for that, that process of sanctification. Continue to work that out in our lives. And uh, this morning, Jesus, we ask that these songs we sing um, would, would reflect the, the truth in our hearts that uh, you are Lord, that we love you, uh, that you are worthy of worship and praise. So Jesus, I pray that our worship would honor you and lift you up this morning. In your name we pray, amen. You guys sing with me, all right? One, two, three, four. Darkness, darkness tries to roll over my bones. Sing it out. Sorrow comes to steal the joy Oh, 
glorious day I stand in awe I stand in awe of you Truly, we, we do look forward to that day when we can see you face to face, when you take us up, when you gather us into your arms. And uh, Jesus, we, we pray that that, that assuredness, that hope, um, that security that we have in you uh, would just bring joy in our lives, would bring perspective in our lives. Help us to see uh, things just with, with that heavenly, eternal mindset, that heavenly perspective. And Jesus, we do ask that you would seal our hearts, that you would protect us from ourselves and just our, our, our own wickedness and our own sin that uh, gets in the way of fellowship with you. Uh, so Jesus, uh, we just lift up the rest of the service that you would uh, just show yourself strong through your word, that you would send your helper, send your spirit to illuminate your word. Help us to know you better, Jesus. Help us to look more like you. 
We love you, and it's your name we pray. Amen. My hair always gets in the way. Anyway, guys, we have announcements ahead, and then after that, our very own solo. So here we go, all right? Thank you for joining us online. We are honored to have you with us. Here are a few announcements. Midweek Community Gathering Our Midweek Community Gathering is Tuesday nights at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. Join us for online community, discussion, encouragement, and prayer. Go to our Instagram page for more details. Prayer Requests if you need prayer for anything, you can send prayer requests to our prayer team at info at movementnyc.org or 917-809-6886. Giving. We have three easy ways to give. First, make a one-time or recurring donation at movementnyc.org give. You can also give on Venmo at Movement NYC or mail a check to Movement Church 3944 51st Street Woodside, New York 11377 Please subscribe and follow us on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube for more details and announcements. everybody solo here um let me first start out by saying i assure you mike doyle did not uh gain seven shades of darkness overnight <laughs> he just uh graciously allowed me to teach one of these advent teachings and uh let's let's give it up for mike doyle um <laughs> courageous fearless leader um who leads well and um he trusts the Lord, obviously. <laughs> um, we've been in a, a series called The Blessed Hope. And um, during this time, we are, we're celebrating the arrival of Christ, the arrival of the Messiah. Um, Israel waited for him for centuries. And um, he gave, God gave Christ to his people. And as we celebrate Christmas, there's just so much electricity and excitement as it gets closer. I mean, all the songs, they testify to it, right? Our favorite songs. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I mean, I, I start singing that as soon as the season comes in. Um, I'll be home for Christmas. Silver bells um, in the air. There's a feeling of Christmas. And one of our favorites, um, it's the most wonderful time of the year, right? And it is. Even the Ebenezer Scrooges of the world, they become humbled and broken, and they become cheery even and grateful. And yet there's also this tension because there's this excitement for what's to come and this almost sense that we can't wait for it to be fulfilled. Um, and even as Israel waited for Christ to come the first time, we too, we wait for him to come a second time. And as we learned, this hope of his return is called the blessed hope. And it's a hope that's sure, and it's an anchor for our souls, as Pastor Mike taught us a, a couple of weeks back. And we are still waiting. We're waiting for the Messiah to come. We're waiting for Jesus to come and rescue us. But we're waiting in hope. And that's the title of my message this morning, Waiting in Hope. And in the passage that we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 2, we're going to see three things about this blessed hope. We're going to see that this hope involves waiting and faithfulness. We're going to see that our hope is secured by the word of God. And finally, we're going to see that the end of our blessed hope is both sure and greater than we could ever imagine. 
So uh, as we get started, let's just read the passage in Luke chapter 2. We'll start in verse 22, um, where it says, And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Let's pray. Um, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you left it for us to give us clear direction and also, Lord, to give us sure and solid hope. And I pray that we would leave this time being more hopeful, more grounded in the blessed hope, and Lord, eager for your return. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the first things that we see here, we see Joseph and Mary, they're bringing Jesus to perform um, and dedicate him to the Lord. Um, as the law said, the child that opens the womb needs to be dedicated to the Lord. And so that's what they were going to do. And also... Um, as is described in Leviticus tap, chapter 12. You can read it. I won't bore you with all the details, but basically um, when a woman gave birth, if a male child, she gave birth to a male child, she would have to wait 40 days and then go to the temple and perform a ceremony so that she could be uh, spiritually, ceremonially clean. And the offering that they were supposed to offer was a lamb that was to be a burnt offering or and a turtle dove or a pigeon that was to be the sin offering. And so we see Joseph and Mary doing this. And so we see that they were faithful Jews. They were living according to the law and they did it without fanfare. You know, they weren't celebrity Christians, as it were. They didn't have a high profile Instagram account curated with lovely photos. They were just regular everyday Joes. No, no pun intended, Joe, Joseph. And, um, you know, he, um, he was a carpenter. We all know that. And he was a man of humble means. And we see that because they offered two turtle doves or two pigeons, one of the two. We're not exactly sure. But we know they didn't offer a lamb. And that provision was made for people who couldn't afford to bring a lamb without spot. And so we know that they were of humble means. And another thing we see, Joseph, he was a good husband. He went with Mary, you know. Um, and so a note to all you husbands, go with your wives to those important appointments. Don't, don't leave them out in the cold. Um, and we read in Matthew chapter 1 that he was just. He was a just man. And so they just were living their lives faithfully serving God. They really had simple hopes. Mary and Joseph just hoped to get married and hope to have a family. And then God invited them into a larger scene that they would be uh, rearing the Messiah, whom they waited for. Um, and we know that they waited for him because, again, they kept the law of Moses. And another thing that they did waiting, they waited to be with each other. Joseph, we read, in Matthew chapter 125, he didn't know Mary sexually until after she had given birth to Jesus. And so to be clear, he didn't know her before, but he did know her afterwards. So um, he did consummate that wedding. 
Now, in the next couple of verses, in verses 25 through 27, we see Simeon. And I love this description of him, that he was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Um, In another version, it says just instead of righteous. And what that word means, it means innocent. Um, one whose life is wholly conformed to the will of God. Now, when you look on the Blue Letter Bible website or their app, great resource, by the way, it says that that word just really can only be applied to Christ. Yet the scripture is testifying here that this man was just. Um, But he too, like Joseph, was just a regular dude. And he was living his regular life, but God was at the center of his life. His name means one who hears and obeys. And Herbert Lockyer, he has this great series called the All Series. You should pick it up. It's got all the men of the Bible, the women of the Bible, the promises of the Bible, everything you need to know. But Herbert Lockyer, he writes this about Simeon. This spectator of the most significant birth of all history Endued with a prophetic spirit, kept the lamp of prophecy burning when religion was at a low ebb in Israel. This saintly Simeon knew the voice speaking in the prophets of old and obeyed the light that he saw. Simeon was devout, which basically means he was just doing his best to live a godly life and to hold on to the Lord. Other than that, there was really nothing special about him. He didn't hold a special title or a special position, but he did walk by the Spirit. And he happened to be in the temple this day by the Spirit of God. And so we have three great examples here. Joseph, Mary, and Simeon. Regular people living regular lives, but they were faithful while they waited for the Lord. You know, some of us aren't waiting for the Lord. I don't know. I don't know what some of us are waiting for, but we're not waiting for the Lord. But these three people, they absolutely were. And it it can be shown by the lives that they led. And they were regular people. And, And that just goes to show that you don't need to be anyone special in God's kingdom. There's nothing wrong with being a husband, a businessman, a wife, a mother, an old dude who's just hanging around the temple. (laughs) God invites everyone into the story of his hope that he's bringing to the world. And so while we wait for the Lord to come, while we have this blessed hope, it's so important to both wait and to be faithful to what we're doing. Um, Again, He's described as waiting for the consolation of Israel. And that word consolation is paraklesis. And it's similar to the word paraclete, which we know we get the Holy Spirit from, and it means comforter. This word also means comfort, consolation. Um, And it's a great title for Jesus. Jesus brings such great comfort to the soul, to the heart that has received him. And I love even this time of year. It's such a comforting time of year as we anticipate time with family, life slowing down, giving and receiving gifts. Um, In a book called The Wonderful Names of Our Wonderful Lord, Charles E. Holbert and T.C. Horton, they write this about Simeon. Simeon was waiting for the deliverance of the Jews by the coming of the Messiah. They did not receive him as a nation, But some did and were consoled, and Israel shall yet have the promised consolation. Who among us doesn't need comfort and consolation? Again, Christmas can be a very comforting time, but for some of us, it can be a time where there there is little comfort. Um, It can bring great sorrow because of loved ones who aren't here anymore. Or because times are difficult financially and and there won't be as many gifts. Maybe there won't be any gifts at all. Um, But like Simeon, if we are willing to receive the greater comfort, which is the presence of Christ, God with us, Emmanuel, we too can be consoled. 
<clears throat> and you know, Simeon, I, in my mind, I'm thinking he's an older guy. He's an old dude. Um, and here's something interesting. He didn't get to see Jesus until 40 days after his birth. I mean, could you imagine getting your Christmas gift on February 3rd? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the way the mail is working right now, I mean, some of us <laughs> might actually be getting our Christmas gifts on February 3rd. But, you know, here's a guy, he has been told by the Spirit of God, he's not going to die until he sees the Christ. Now, the buzz had been out there. The shepherds had seen the Christ. Um, and so word had gotten around. Maybe he had heard something. I don't know. But he was waiting. And, you know, it just makes me think sometimes waiting can get tiring. Um, myself, earlier in the week, I was complaining <laughs> about waiting, you know, and um, just being tired of it. We all can wonder sometimes, why am I waiting? What am I waiting for? Why haven't I been blessed I'm tired of being alone. I'm tired of my family members not being saved. I'm tired of life struggles and difficulties. I'm tired of people who annoy me. Uh, I'm tired of trying. I'm tired of trying to have a baby. I'm tired of trying to be the bigger person, to be a good Christian, to fit in. And even in the worst case scenarios, some of us may even feel like we're tired of living. And that's a very real sentiment, and I don't want to understate it. You know, and, and when we come to these places, it's so important to consider, well, what is it that we're waiting for? Who is it or what is it that we're hoping for? You know, if all that we're waiting for and hoping for are the things in this life, it can lead to great hopelessness, great disappointment, great despair. You know, and, and if you're someone who you've come to your end and, and you don't even want to be here anymore, the first thing I would say is, you know, please talk with someone. You'd be surprised who is so glad to have you here and who has such great joy because of your presence. But I also want to say there is a better hope, a better hope than being married someday, than having children, than um, being financially stable one day, than having perfect help, health. The hope of Christ's return is a better hope, and it's a sure hope. And we can have that hope secured in our own hearts that can allow us to overcome all the other disappointments in our life. And the next thing we're going to see here is that hope, that blessed hope of Christ's return is secured by the word of God. In verses 28 through 31, um, one of the things that Simeon declares in verse 29, he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. I love that. His hope was obtained by and found in God's word. By the spirit, God had somehow communicated his very word to Simeon. And it was personal and it was specific God always delivers on his word. And this is an important point, you know. A lot of times we sing a lot of songs, you know, about the promise or his promises. And we kind of sing it in some vague, ethereal sense and, and apply it to whatever desires that we have. Um, we say things like, I'm believing God for a miracle or, or my breakthrough, and look, God is a God of miracles and a God of breakthroughs, and he absolutely performs them. But we can't hold God responsible for things that he didn't say. Here, when God spoke to Simeon, he was specific. He said, you will see the Christ before you depart this life. Um, he didn't say, Simeon, you're going to have a house on a hill. You're going to live your best life today. He did say, that he would see the Lord's Christ. He didn't promise him a, a, a healthy life, but he did promise him that he would see the Lord's Christ. And so it's important to not confuse the things that we necessarily hope for in our own heart, which the Lord may very well give, with those things that the Lord has specifically said. When he spoke to Zacharias and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's uh, parents, he was specific. 
and he came through on his word. When he spoke to Joseph and Mary about Jesus' birth, he was specific, and he came through on his word. When he spoke to the shepherds, he was specific, and he came through on his word. Whenever we see God speaking, he does give specificity, and he's expecting those who he speaks to to take him at his word. And Simeon had hope that he would see the Messiah. And the reason he had hope was because of the word of God. The word of God is what secured him this hope. And where his hope was grounded was in that very same word. And it needs to be true of us as we look for Christ's second coming, the blessed hope. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 that the word of prophecy that we have is a more sure word. I love that. The word of God, Jesus tells us in Luke 21, 33, will never pass away. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, Jesus's word, will endure forever. It will never pass away. The scripture tells us that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever. There's a fourth obscure unsung verse um, in Amazing Grace that I love. And it says this, the Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my seal and portion be as long as life endures. For me personally, I know that God has always confirmed truth to me in his word. Whenever I've needed some security, some hope, a sense of the direction that I've needed to take, it's always come through the word of God. And then he would confirm it with other people. And here again, this account shows us that our blessed hope is secured in the word of God. That's where we find it, in the word of God. And that's where it's maintained in the word of God. Um, We know in Psalm 1, it tells us that the one who meditates on the word of God day and night will be fruitful in all that he does, and he will bear fruit in due season. And finally, this will be my last point. What we see from these verses is that the end of our hope is sure and is greater than we can imagine. After Simeon says that he's the Lord is allowing him to depart, He begins to make this prophetic declaration. He says, For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. So we see here that this this hope, one, is sure. What God had promised to Simeon, it came to pass. He delivered on. Could you imagine being told, you're going to see the Christ. You're going to see the Messiah before you die. And then it actually happens. I mean, no wonder he grabbed Jesus, lifted him up in his arms and began to make prophetic declarations. I would be, and I I don't really use this word in my everyday life, but I would be stoked. I would be absolutely (laughs) stoked if God had told me I would see the Messiah before I die. And then I see him like, I mean, could you imagine that? Um, And over and over again, as I said earlier, we see God doing what he says he will do. He told Mary and Joseph, you're going to have a child. This child will be conceived of the Holy Spirit. And it happened. He told Elizabeth and Zacharias, who were too old really to have children, you're going to have a son and you're going to name him John. And it happened. Jesus tells us in John 14, that he is going to prepare a place for us and that he will return so that he will receive us unto himself, that where he is, we can be with him also. He will come through on his word. We've seen him do it before and we know he'll do it again. And these verses, finally, they also show that our hope is far greater than we could ever imagine. You see, It was far greater than what God had promised to any of the individuals that he had brought into this salvation story. You know, it was far more larger 
and more encompassing than Mary and Joseph, who received a son conceived of the Holy Spirit, who would save his people. It was far greater than Israel alone, to whom he had promised a Messiah. And it was far greater than the Gentiles alone, who, even though we, we hadn't been explicitly included in the initial covenant, we were grafted into the second. No, what the hope that God had promised far exceeded all of those individual stories, and it involved everyone, and it would include the salvation of the entire world, past, present, and future. Now, we know that Christ's second coming will bring tremendous blessings, a completely new world and cosmos, new glorified bodies, the end of tears and sorrow, reunion with loved ones. But these verses show us that the blessed hope will go far beyond what we can grasp of what's been told us in the word and even what we could ever imagine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're told, as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even come up with what God will do and what he has prepared for those who love him. You know, I always say you could take the team of all the greatest minds. You could assemble your team and you could have an eternity to assemble, reassemble, disassemble, add people onto your team, take people off, build, tear down, rebuild, make changes, make edits to a perfect world. And you have all eternity to do it you and I would never even be able to come close to what God has prepared for us because the scripture says we can't even imagine it. So in conclusion, our blessed hope, we see it has three things, um, three aspects to it. It will require waiting and faithfulness. It's secured by the word of God. And it's sure and far greater than anything we could ever imagine. You know, the hope that we're to hold on to above all other hopes is the hope of Jesus' return. This hope is sure, and it's an anchor for the soul. Our other hopes may very well disappoint, but no matter how all the other hopes turn out, this one will remain, and it will not disappoint. Let's uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Um, Lord, I thank you. Um, for how much truth you pack into a small set of verses. Lord, we thank you that you've given us the eyewitness testimony of your son's first coming and even his resurrection from the dead that gives us security to know that what you promised you will do, Lord. You will come again for us and you will bring us to be with you forever. And Lord, I pray for any who have lost hope that somehow, God, you would connect them so that they would again find hope, find hope in you, find hope to go on, to carry on. And Lord, I pray for those who've had hopes disappointed, God, that they would look up to you and see something that they haven't seen before. And God, I pray for those of us who are hopeful that we would be a light. You would use us to spread that to others, God. Lord, we thank you. We just commit all these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, these pieces broken
like me I once was lost But now I have found it Was blind but now I see Amazing grace Amazing grace A sweet and a sound That saved a wretch like me aches for it, really, uh, that Jesus, we keep our eyes on you. Again, we keep a, a heavenly perspective on everything we endure, everything we, we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Jesus, thank you for the gift of your word. Uh, thank you for uh, every spiritual gift you bless us with daily. And uh, Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, I hope you have an amazing rest of your Christmas weekend. Um, just relax, chill, catch a breath. And uh, I'll see you guys in 2021. Wow. Wild. God bless you guys. <laughs>